Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Well, we begin this morning by singing, and uh, you'll find it at number 151 in these blue uh, books of ours. Number 151, a great hymn by Horatius Bonar, our Scottish hymn writer. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. Great I am, the three in one. Number 151. As we sit, as we sit, we join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, great and gracious, King of angels, King of nations, King of all glory, we bow, Lord, in your presence, the great triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the great I Am the creator and the sustainer of all that there is, all that has been, all that ever shall be. And we acknowledge your glory, the glory that is due to your name and your name alone. And we do so, Lord, in awe and in reverence and in humility as we bow before you, our maker, and yet we do also with wonder and with love and with great joy. For you, Lord, the God who made us, you also are the one who has come to save us, to save us from our sin, from our pride, from our arrogance, from our calamitous folly in seeking our own glory apart from you and without you and away from you in ways that can only lead to disaster, to loss, and to utter shame. But, 
Glory be to him who bought us, who came and who washed us from each guilty stain, who stooped down to save us, so that you have made us frail, frail creatures of dust, though we are, made us kings, that we also might reign forever with our Lord Jesus Christ, our great Savior. And not only might we be his, but we might share in his eternal glory. How we marvel, Lord, at the, the true nature of your greatness displayed to all this universe, the heavens above, the earth beneath, all the heavenly hosts, not in the height of your own self-exaltation, but rather in the depths of your own self-humbling to the marveling eyes of heaven, stum stumbling, it seemed, but all in your plan and purpose to humble yourself that you might come and save a people such as we are we might be saved from our sins and saved for your service that we might at last attain the destiny for which you created us, that we should reflect your glory forever and ever to the whole world. How we marvel, Lord, at the greatness of your redeeming grace. Now we praise you for the marvelousness of your mercy. And so, Lord, we pray that as we gather together this morning as a company of your people, touched by your grace, so would you touch us afresh this day with the knowledge of your goodness. Draw near to us, Lord, and speak to our hearts, we ask, that our hearts might be those that overflow with your love and with your mercy and with your grace and with your generosity, that the fragrance of your sweet presence might be all around us, not only this day as we meet together in your name, but every day of this coming week as we work and interact with others in this city, with our friends, with our families, with strangers, that they might see in us that they might hear from us and sense in our lives something of the sweetness and the joy and the wonder of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. So hear us, Lord, in this our morning prayer. Draw near to us as we draw near to you in faith and trust and help us. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, let me uh, welcome you all this morning, very warmly indeed. If you're visiting with us, uh, then let me say that you're particularly welcome. That's true whether you're up here and I can see you or whether you're in one of the rooms downstairs. I hope you can see and hear us, uh, even though we can't see you. But uh, we hope that after the service, we'll have a chance to greet you. And uh, let me just say how welcome you are here in the name of the Lord Jesus, and in the name of his uh, fellowship here at the Tron. We welcome very particularly today uh, Isaac Shaw, who's going to be our guest preacher this morning. Uh, Isaac is the director of the Delhi Bible Institute. He's here with uh, Gloria, his wife, and with some friends uh, from the United States. He's over in Britain for uh, a series of meetings, one of which was the international board meeting for the DBI, which uh, I was at yesterday with Isaac. Uh, and in a minute or two, I'm going to bring Isaac up here and just uh, introduce him to you and uh, let him say a few words before he comes to preach to us later on. But Isaac, it's lovely to have you back with us at the Tron, and uh, we're honored to have you here, and we rejoice in the fellowship that we share together. Just before I get Isaac up, can I draw your attention to these sheets uh, that you've received? There are lots of notices there for uh, the church family. If you look at the middle panel, you'll see that uh, tomorrow afternoon the Ladies' Fellowship have got the pleasure of Isaac and Gloria to be speaking to them. So uh, I'm sure that uh, visitors and uh, extras will be more than welcome at that meeting. Do come tomorrow at 2 and uh, 
hear more about the work of the Delhi Bible Institute and all of its different uh, manifestations. You'll see there the other things uh, going on as usual this week. Please do keep these in your prayers uh, as we pray together as a church family for all these different things. On the right, you'll see there there's a notice about church membership. And uh, if you have uh, come to the Lord Jesus uh, in faith recently and uh, are being discipled here among us, and uh, would like to uh, become a member of the congregation, then now's the time to begin to come and speak to us. Likewise, if you've come to Glasgow and found fellowship with us here in the congregation and you want to make this your church, well, let me encourage you to make it your church uh, officially as well as uh, just uh, in name and uh, consider coming to membership with us. There'll be a class uh, where I explain what that's all about uh, in a little while, but if you give us your details, then we'll be able to make you aware of that, and uh, I'd be glad to meet with you and speak more about that. A number of other notices there uh, in the coming weeks, and you'll see at the bottom we're praying for Roy Murray, uh, supposed to be coming back to Glasgow tomorrow, but um, in rather typical fashion it's uh, been a little bit delayed, and I think it's going to be later in the week uh, before Roy finishes his packing and gets uh, here. But uh, perhaps you just pray for final arrangements. There's been some difficulty with his uh, 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 sending uh, things home with some new rules that have been brought in in Vietnam. He can't have anything sent after he's physically left the country, so he has to actually do it himself before he leaves. Uh, so perhaps you'd pray that all of that will be sorted out and he'd be home with us uh, soon at the end of this week. Well, I'll leave you to uh, read the rest of these and digest them at your leisure, but Isaac, would you like to uh, uh, come up and I'll introduce you. Isaac is a good friend of our congregation here. He's been here many times over recent years. I think the last time was perhaps a couple of years ago, and uh, we've uh, moved house, as it were, since then. But uh, you're equally welcome here. Many of us, uh, probably most of us, know Isaac and know all about the work in India. But Isaac, we've always got new people here. Um, so just very briefly, briefly introduce to us the work of the, the Delhi Bible Institute, where you're director. This is the 60th year yes. of the DBI. Uh, you haven't been there right since the beginning, <laughs> I hasten to add. So uh, just tell us briefly, uh, what is DBI and uh, what's it all about? Uh, it's a great privilege to be back at the Tron. <coughs> and uh, 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 last year, uh, Willie was with us for the uh, World Conference and again this year. And thank you for sharing him with us. Uh, and uh, we have appreciated the ministry uh, of Ali very much uh, in our midst. Uh, great to be back. Delhi Bible Institute was started by an Irish missionary from Northern Ireland, from Belfast, uh, Robert Duff. And he came to India in 1947. And from a shop front, which is now uh, just central Delhi, that was at that time the extreme of Delhi, started a church with just about 10 or 15 people uh, and uh, remained about that number for the next two years. And then there was an amazing opening of the doors uh, uh, when uh, through just one evangelistic outreach we received an overwhelming response that led to, in 1954, uh, to the establishing of uh, Delhi Bible Institute. Uh, it was then established as a watershed for evangelism, church planting, uh, and equipping of believers, new believers who are coming to us. Uh, and uh, that is exactly what Delhi Bible Institute has been doing uh, these uh, last uh, uh, 60 years. Robert has, uh, went on to be with the Lord in, in 2001. I was mentored for about 18 years. You know how long it took, you know, to be, for me to be mentored. Uh, uh, and uh, I, uh, I took over from him uh, in about 1992 and have been leading the works since then. And the work now is not just in Delhi. It is uh, it's spread into other parts of North India, and that's all part of uh, something that you've called Vision 2025. Would you like to explain a little bit about that to us? Yeah, Vision uh, 2025 is based on the top six needs that are there in North India. When you look at India, with this 1.2 billion people, birthplace of Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, Buddhism, very religious country 
who would nod to anything religious you throw at them, you know, you, you, you say Jesus is God and they will say absolutely, you know, then uh, because they believe in all these millions of God, nature, animal, birds, everything is God uh, for them. You look at that nation, you say, where do we start? North India is 600 million people. And then on top of it, if uh, right across North India is the river Ganges that flows. We call it the great seductress river Ganges because in Hindu mythology they believe that if once in your life you take a holy cleansing dip, you know, it is really dirty dip, you know, because it's worse than a sewer. Uh, uh, if, if you take one of those dips, your past, present, and future sins are all washed away. You know, this is a shortcut to salvation. Now, when you are facing those masses, the issue is where do you start? And do you know exactly where the Word of God and the Lord has instructed us to go and make disciples? And uh, Vision 2025 is about going and making disciples and equipping them, discipling them, training them with very, very simple methods that we have. We have, uh, we call it one, 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 one week, one month, one year program. And we do a lot of training in the one month program, about 3,000 people right across. That number sounds very big, but look in the context of the 600 million that are there uh, in North India. It is not even a drop in the ocean. Uh, but we have teams that go and faithfully teach God's word to new believers. Uh, the vision is that we will be able uh, to equip through these simple methods about 60,000 men by 2025 uh, so that that would result in church planting in villages, in towns, in small places right across North India. And the vision is to go to each of the state capitals. If I give you just a picture of just one state where we are, Uttar Pradesh, uh, where uh, we have uh, a center which we started in 2007. Uttar Pradesh has got a population of 205 million people. On its own, it would be the fifth largest country in the world. Christian population would be 0.01%. Okay. Uh, uh, where do you start? Again, just simple obedience of going and making disciples and equipping them to go and make disciples of others. So that is Vision 2025, it is, is basically equipping the saints, uh, providing resources in the Hindi language, helping the poor. You come across poor right across everywhere. But if you see in the priority, it is first equipping, discipling, providing resources in the Hindi language then helping the poor in the context of the church, and then networking with other like-minded people and opening centers, which your church was instrumental in going with us to Ranchi. So you're, just tell us then which centers you have opened. With Delhi at the center, what was next? And just, just tell us, just go through the different centers and tell us where you are. Yes, and uh, do you know uh, uh, if uh, your geography is any, uh, uh, anyway, like my geography of Scotland, you know, there is a brochure out there which you can pick up and the whole itinerary is there of how we arrived, where we are. Uh, but in 2006, we started a center in the state capital of Uttarakhand, uh, Dehradun. Uh, and then in 2007, in the state capital of Uttar Pradesh, Lucknow. And then we went on to Chandali, uh, which is eastern Uttar Pradesh and then to Ranchi, and last year in uh, uh, Chandigarh, which is the capital of Punjab, and by God's grace, uh, this year in January in Jaipur, that is the capital of uh, Rajasthan. So by God's grace, among the 12 destinations that uh, are uh, our target in Vision 2025, we are in seven at the moment. And so uh, Ramraj, who moved <coughs> from one to another to start the new, uh, many of these new s situations. Ramaj is currently in Ranchi, but is going to be moving to Jaipur in about a month's time, is that right? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, you, uh, I, I, would, I would reassure you, don't be nervous, uh, because uh, when we started Rachi with, in partnership with Tron, uh, Ramraj uh, uh, came from Lucknow to lead the work uh, in Rachi. Rachi work has been established since 2011. We have now a church that meets there regularly with about 30, 35 people. And there are five small uh, gatherings that meet just on the outskirts of Rachi. Each would have about 10 to 15 uh, people among them. So that is established and is growing. Uh, Poonam, who was with Ramraj, is going to carry on there. But Sunil, uh, again a first generation Hindu convert who was leading our Lucknow Center, is moving uh, to Rachi uh, to lead the Rachi Center. And Ramraj, on 2nd of April, is going to move to Jaipur to now start establishing the center in Jaipur. It's wonderful to see the, uh, the ongoing momentum uh, of these things. And it's wonderful to see the way the Lord has, has provided for each step of the way. Uh, part of that, obviously, is um, your ambassadorial work. Uh, mm -hmm. around the world, here and in America and other places, um, telling churches like ours about the work and, uh, and <coughs> excuse me, raising support and so on. So you're in the UK for a couple of weeks just now. <coughs> excuse me. Um, tell us what you're doing and uh, what we can pray for. Uh, uh, do you know the Lord builds his kingdom through relationships and partnership? You know, uh, such a privilege to be standing before Alistair here. Uh, we have a great partnership with uh, uh, Parkside Church, which, which has come alongside DBI uh, in strengthening our hands and reaching uh, North India. It's all about relationship. Relationship with God's Son, uh, Jesus, and how that transforms us, and then with His greater family. And uh, we, we are going to be around for two weeks, uh, along with our friends Russ and Nancy, who are here with us, uh, who partner with us in, uh, in U.S., uh, on the U.S. board, and uh, just going and meeting other churches. We have got a charity here, Partners in Service, that was established in the 80s, uh, just to promote the ministry of Delhi Bible Institute. The board meeting is on Saturday, but again, going to different churches and meeting old friends and making new friends uh, and uh, looking for more partners who would come with us uh, in this great work that the Lord is doing in North India. Well, it's great to have you with us, Isaac. Let me just pray for you here while, we, uh, while all of this is fresh in our mind. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these 60 years of the work in the Delhi Bible Institute. We thank you very especially for the vision that you have given Isaac and his colleagues in recent years to see that work expand right across that vast area and vast population of North India. We dare to ask, Heavenly Father, <clears throat> that through the vision that you've given them, you will provide the beginnings of a work which will last and which will bear wonderful fruit for the gospel, so that on the great day when the Lord Jesus appears, and there are indeed people of every tribe and tongue and nation praising the name of Christ, there will be a multitude that no man can number from among those people groups of North India that have been served by DBI and by many other also in that part of India. Mm. We pray, Lord, for our dear brother Ramraj and for all the work that he has done in establishing the center at Ranchi with which we have such a connection and are so committed to in prayer. We pray, Lord, that uh, as he leaves Punam behind and as Sunil moves there to take on the work, that you would continue to bless, that the work there would flourish and grow and that the training that goes on from that center in so many ways would increase the number of churches and bring many into the ministries of evangelism and mission mm. in that state of Jharkhand. Mm. We pray for Ramraj and his wife and children as they make that long move uh, to uh, Jaipur in Rajasthan. We ask, Lord, that you would settle them quickly, that uh, their accommodation would be suitable 
that the schooling for the children would be worked out and that all of their needs would be met so that once again, Lord, that remarkable servant of Christ might begin to sow seed and to plough and to plant, that a new work there might be quickly established and that many more might be sent out into the harvest fields from that place. We pray, Lord, for Isaac and Gloria and for Russ and Nancy as they travel around in this next couple of weeks. We pray for all the meetings that they will have with other churches. We thank you, Lord, tonight they'll be with uh, Harper Church across the river there, part of our gospel partnership here in Glasgow. We pray that they too would be encouraged by all that they hear. Mm. We pray for Isaac as he speaks with the Cornhill students during this week and with some of our groups also, and ask that that sense of fellowship and partnership in the gospel would be increased and would be nourished for the glory of your name. We pray for safety and travel and energy for them in all that they do as they seek to bring the needs of the DBI before more Christian people in this land and beyond. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that your hand would be upon them for good, to bless them, that all of their labors for Christ might not be in vain, but that you might richly bless and bring a wonderful harvest, thirty and sixty and a hundredfold, that on the great day of the Lord, there might be praise and blessing and glory for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Isaac. And uh, we look forward to you opening God's Word to us shortly. We're going to turn now to God's Word and to read in uh, Luke's Gospel, where Isaac is going to be preaching from uh, this morning. And uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, if you have one of our church visitors' Bibles, that's page 877, page 877, and we're reading the first eight verses. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? on earth. Amen. And may God bless to us his word. We're going to sing now a hymn on the screens. As we come before you to pray, we feel our sins will make you turn away, and yet we long to know that we've been forgiven, and your smile is resting on your church again.
Well, our offerings for the Lord's work will now be received. But as we do that in the quiet, as the musicians play, perhaps you'd like to meditate on these words we'll be studying shortly, or perhaps just pray for those in need at this time. Let's pray. The Lord Jesus said, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. The gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Our gracious God, how we do thank you amidst the shifting sands of the politics and the history of our world that we have this sure word of our Lord and Savior that tells us that nothing is remove one iota from your plan, that your purpose for this world shall be fulfilled in every detail and in every moment, and that nothing but nothing is beyond your control. What comfort that gives us, Lord, and what joy also, because we know that your gospel shall triumph in this world and that all that you have purposed shall be accomplished, so that, as the prophet said, your word will never return to you void. 
will accomplish all that you plan and all that you purpose. We look out today, Lord, upon a world full of wars and rumors of wars, upheaval, nation rising against nation, one nation marching across the borders of another, annexing it and conquering it. In many other places, we know of similar strife and bloodshed, civil unrest, civil war. How easy it is, Lord, for us to panic and lose sight of the promises that you give us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us as Christian people to look upon, upon this world through eyes <clears throat> and through minds that are informed by your truth that we would <clears throat> listen to the news reports and read our papers, not only with an eye to what correspondents are saying and what pundits are discussing, but in the light of an unfolding history upon which we can rely and upon which we can be absolutely certain. We thank you, Lord, that it is your church and it is the message of your gospel that is the key to this world's history, its future, that no great power, no great nation, no great leader can sway the future of this earth. But we do pray, Heavenly Father, for all that we see going on in Russia and its borders at the moment, in the events in the Crimea and in the Ukraine, the ferment that it's caused in Europe and across the world. We have not the wisdom, Lord, to know what to ask or how to pray. And yet we do pray, Father. We come to you, the just judge, who has promised to hear your people's prayers. And we know that you will answer, even though we pray in human ignorance, because we pray trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray in his name. We ask, Lord, for the peace of that region, for the protection of its people. We pray that you would give wisdom to the leaders of the great powers that are involved, both in Russia and in the European Union and in the United States and in NATO, the United Nations. We ask, Heavenly Father, that we would be spared from seeing an escalation of violence, an escalation of uh, political tension and of national aggression. We pray, Lord, for peace. We ask that you would hear us and that you would have mercy upon us. We are conscious, Lord, when we see and hear of these kinds of things in our news, we're conscious of the fragility of human power. When we read constantly day after day of these ships and planes and satellites scouring that southern Indian Ocean, looking in vain thus far for the remains of that disappeared airliner, we are reminded how small we are as human beings, even in the face of one great ocean upon this earth, never mind the rest of the earth, the rest of the galaxy, and indeed of this unfathomable universe of which we are but a speck. Yet, O oh Lord, you hold all this in the palm of your hand. You tell us also that he who made the stars numbers the very hairs of our heads. How can we fathom these things, but what comfort and what joy these words give us. So help us, Lord, in our helplessness. Help us as your people, your children, to know how to pray. Teach us, we pray, how to pray. That we might in all things bring our needs, our desires, our hopes, our fears before you, a loving and a caring Heavenly Father who hears us and who has power and who has promised to answer us. We think on what Isaac has said to us already about 
the vastness of the task in a land the size of India with its teeming millions, a billion and more people, a home of so many religions, and yet a home to so much terrible darkness. Lord, have mercy, we pray. Bless and encourage and cause to flourish the work of your church right across North India, and very especially all of those associated with the work of our dear brother and sister here. How we thank you for them, and how we thank you for the privilege that we have in sharing in a small way in all that they are seeking to do for Christ there. Help us, Lord, not to be overwhelmed with a task that is so great. Remind us, we ask, of the greatness of your power and of your Holy Spirit who is given to your church for witness that there might be the power of heaven brought to earth through the preaching of your gospel, which has power to change and transform and bring salvation eternally to everyone who believes, great or small, rich or poor, near or far. And so, Lord, as we come this morning to hear your word proclaimed to us afresh, we ask that you would help us open our ears and open our hearts, give us a hunger and a thirst for that word of life. Give us a determination to receive it and digest it and understand it and rejoice in it and obey it and follow it with all that we are and all that we have. Teach us thy way, O God, we pray, that we might be a people who pray and a people who proclaim the greatness of he who called us out of darkness and into light. So draw near to us, Lord. Answer us and hear our prayers. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in prayer as we sing the hymn on the screen. Our Father God, who dwells in heaven, draw near to hear your children.
Shall we turn into our Bibles to the passage that was read before us from Luke chapter 18 and verse 1? When we come to a passage like this, we are very deeply aware that when it comes to prayer in our lives, how easy it is to give up. We all strongly believe in prayer. You have heard those words that says, much prayer, much power, little prayer, little power, no prayer, uh, no power. And then we face life issues, and it is so easy then to give up in prayer. Even the Lord saw this and then presented this uh, parable to us, that the disciples of Christ should always pray and not give up. Do we all believe that our God answers prayers? Our God is not like that judge we hear in this passage, hard to get answers from. Rather, he is the counter example of this judge mentioned in this parable. He is the one who is willing and able to answer our prayers. The point of the parable is to encourage us in persistent prayers so that we don't give up. Disciples of Christ should always pray and not give up. This is such an important principle for us today in our family life, in our church lives, and very especially in international missions. When we are there to proclaim the gospel to others, prayer is such an important uh, preparation before we do anything. It's very interesting that the people we prayed for, the areas in India that we prayed for, the Lord eventually took us there to minister among those people. The other very important part of our prayer life is that we are coming to a God who is sovereign, who decides what He will do, and yet He has given you and I, mere mortal creatures, we are just specks in this universe, the privilege to ask. And the strange thing is, this sovereign God answers prayers. I, I, I want to encourage you, family of God, this morning to be persistent in our prayers. Because God answers prayers. I want to ask you, does this view of God as sovereign and yet answering our prayers reflect your and my prayer life? Do I see God as the unjust judge who has got his hand clasped tight on the answers that I seek or the one who is ready and overflowing with his blessings. As a child in the Sunday school, I learned this chorus, God answers prayers in the morning. God answers prayer at noon. God answers prayer in the evening. So keep your hearts in tune. We honor God, family of God, by the greatness of our petitions. The more our asking, the greater our asking, the more and greater honor that we bring to our God. Yes, He answers our daily prayers that affect our bodies, our lives, and our circumstances. But let us not just stop there. Let us go beyond uh, the prayers for immediate needs. 
He has said in his word, ask of me, and what will I do? I will give you your favorite job or your dream job. <laughs> no. He does not say, ask of me and those who are unmarried here, I'll give you your favorite boy, your dream girl. He does do that also. But he said, ask of me, and what is on his heart? I will give you the nations and the ends of the earth as your heritage, inheritance. And that's why in a church like this in Glasgow, when you obey and partner, he has given this church a heritage where? In Ranchi, in Jharkhand. Among a people group whose language even I don't know as yet. But that is what God does. Ask when we ask and when we get engaged in what God is doing. Do you know what happens is when we pray, when we are with God and we are intimate with Him, then what happens? He gives us His heart for His people and He takes us there. What I want to encourage you by asking is, is that the way we come to God, knowing that he will give us even the ends of the earth as our inheritance? Does that reflect your praying and my praying? Too often, we give up on our prayers, and too often, our prayers are feeble. The poet and Kelly has very well reflected in his verse, sometimes in the way that we ask. And he says like this, if you had been living when Christ was on earth and had met the Savior kind, what would you have asked him to do for you, supposing you were stone blind? The child considered and then replied, I suppose that without a doubt, I would ask the Lord for a guide dog to lead me daily about. How often thus in our faithless prayers we acknowledge with shame surprise we have only asked for a dog on a chain when he might have opened blind eyes. This parable, family of God, is to motivate us to pray and not to give up. Not give up on our praying and not lose heart. The place where we often give up is the area of prayer. The problem is so serious that in verse 8, the Lord says, However, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on earth? I have to confess to you, family of God, this morning that my prayer life is not what it should be. One of your own men who have inspired us to pray in that part of the land, Robert Murray McShane said, a man is what he is on his knees and no more. You can have great knowledge positions a great a reputation, social standing, even honor in the church. But at the end of the day, our estimate in heaven's eyes come down to this level, what we are on our knees, that we are and no more. We want to look at three things with you this morning, and I want to bring three applications at the end of it. There are three things we need to understand so as not to give up in prayer. About, among many others, I want to deal with the three issues where we easily give up. First is, prayer is warfare. You know, 
I'm, I'm, I'm talking about prayer that is beyond uh, the morning prayer before breakfast or when you get up or when before going to sleep, you pray, you know, I do not know for how many decades I prayed for cockroaches and, uh, you know, spiders because I was afraid of spiders and cockroaches. I'm not talking of those prayers, friends. I'm talking of beyond that. Prayer is warfare, very especially when you pray for the salvation of people. When you pray for siblings, when you pray for family members that have gone astray, when you pray for the salvation of the lost, when you pray for the wickedness that is there and growing in the world, when you see the whole world order almost becoming anti-Christian, when you see again and again legislations worldwide being passed against the church so that we cannot express our convictions that are drawn from the inspired Word of God. When you get into prayer against those things, do you know what is that? That is warfare. And the evil one will open the gates of hell against you. Prayer is warfare. And that's why when we don't understand that and think that it is just a magic or mumbling of a few words, after which we said, Amen, then God is obligated to answer us. No, that is not the position. That is not what God is speaking to us and teaching us in this passage. And the second thing that we need to understand is that we are weak, that you and I are weak people at the end of the day. So much buffeted by the circumstances of our lives and our emotions and our feelings and it is so natural and easy to give up. And finally, I need to simplify my life to be able to pray. Let us look at the first point, prayer is warfare. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Can you imagine how it is? this verse is just loaded, explaining that what our true struggle is. The real battle that is going on in our world is a spiritual battle. In India... The demonic is worshipped openly. Certain Hindu gods are called demon gods. The old serpent is worshipped as the snake god. In the West, it is more subtle. But in both the places, we need the spiritual armor. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5 says... For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, for we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Paul gives us what the armor of God is. He says, he talks about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, feet shod with the shoes of the gospel of peace, the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith, and then gives the final piece of armor in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. And he says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. We need this piece of armor. What is a piece of armor? Prayer. We, if we are going to overcome the devil, we need all prayer. Don't let anything distract you from praying. It might be the phone ringing, the doorbell going, it could be anything. Everything in our life seems to be put before prayer. Then the devil wants it that way. 
And yet we know that, and we can, we can repeat it, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint on his knees. The issue is not about the information that we have. We have the information. How can I thwart his plans to keep me off my knees? I need to understand that this is warfare. This is spiritual warfare. Satan manipulates the ordinary daily circumstances of our lives in order to checkmate us from getting to God and remaining there. Family of God, can I urge you, prioritize prayer. Prioritize prayer. Pray at a time and a place where disruption is less likely. For some, it is early in the morning. For some, it is in the middle of the day. For some, it is late at night. But a time before I have found for my own self, when life gets going and you get caught in it, Look at the example of our Lord in Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. It says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. About 20 years ago, I asked my prayer mentor, What does very early in the morning mean? So he looked at me straight. The brother was from Africa, you know, very candid speaker. He looked at me and he says, morning means six o'clock in Israel. Early morning means five o'clock. Very early morning means four o'clock. Luke chapter 6 verse 12 says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Do you know when when you come across these verses and look at the prayer life of Jesus, praying through the night, Why was it so necessary for him? You know why was it so necessary? He was seeking his father's face before he spoke to the people. Before he spoke to the people about God, he spoke to God. Jesus never allowed the multitude or ministry to get between him and his father. In India, the challenges we face as a church are very peculiar. The hostility and violence against the church on one side and then the demonic oppression on the other side. We found ourselves as a church inadequate in our prayer life. Disciples of Christ should always pray and not give up. You are in a warfare zone if you are in a in in that kind of a spiritual atmosphere where everybody is very religious and not yet knows the true and the living God. What do you do? We found ourselves very inadequate. Do you know, as a church with a vision to reach North India, our prayer summit, which was once in a month, was one and a half hour long. And it was even difficult to fill that one and a half hour. We were all so convinced that this is not enough. So we changed our prayer submit from 9 in the night to 5 in the morning, 8 hours of prayer. And then from 9 in the day to 5 in the evening. The Lord led us there. And then I can tell you the amazing results of that that we experienced as a church. We were praying for specific people groups among whom there were very few Christians. And it is so amazing that by the end of the year, we had people from those people groups showing great interest and coming to church, and many of them baptized. God answers 
prayers. Sovereign God, He answers prayers. Prayer, family of God, is so simple, so strategic, and yet a discipline that is so difficult that the Lord said that disciples of Christ should always pray and not give up. Prayers are like drones, unmanned combat aerial vehicles operated from a remote distance, doing maximum damage on the battle lines. Do you know right from your drawing room, from your studies, from your bedroom, you can pray for areas of the world, and they are not in vain. God listens to them and answers. Family of God, prayer is warfare, very specially when you are praying for the nations. The second thing we need to understand is that I am weak. We are weak creatures. It is important that we know ourselves so as to pray and not give up. My physical body causes me to give up in prayer. My body would rather have an R in bed than an R on my knees. Is that the same for you? Because there are often no obvious, immediate, and visible returns for our praying, we get frustrated very often. We have been conditioned in our world to expect instant everything. We want a quick answer. Anything that cannot be seen is worthless. We lose heart, and then we do not pray. What is the answer to this problem of the weak self? Paul says in the Scriptures, he talks about the discipline of his body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, he says, But I discipline my body and make it my slave. Paul put his body under his godly mind. He subjected it to do what he knew was God's will for him. But do we do that? Discipline is the way by which we learn to control our body. Isn't it amazing, family of God, when you observe the false religions of the world, their discipline and their prayer. In India, as I said, I come from a religious country. At 4 a.m. in the morning, you can hear the Muslim call out to pray. Allah, O Akbar, God is great. Therefore, come and pray. How chilling is that when you hear that? God is great. What is my response? My response is that I need to come and pray. At 5 a.m. in India, you can see the Sikhs rushing off towards their gurdwaras. At 6 o'clock, all the temple bells come alive. They say that they wake up their gods. That's a bit, you know, difficult, troubled. You know, if God goes to sleep, then I am in real trouble. But the issue is this, family of God, that at 7 o'clock, Christians are still turning in their beds, still making up their minds should they wake up or not. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything, everything to God in prayer. We are weak. We are weak creatures. And therefore the Lord says, that the disciples of Christ should pray and not give up. 
my final point to you this morning is that our lives have become too complicated. I need to simplify my life. I'm very busy. Our constant nibbling family of God at the tables of the world leaves us with no appetite for the banquet of God. Constantly nibbling at the tables of the world. Our latest gadgets have become our latest curses. They were invented to be convenient to our lifestyles, but they are certainly not convenient to our prayer life. Our latest gadgets have left us no downtime. We are on electronic leashes all the time. There is no time left to be alone, to be silent, and to contemplate, or to pray, or to reflect. The gadgets were not created to enhance our prayer life. The result is that our lives have become a constant, frantic hive of constant, exhaustive activity as we save all the time and then use it up in some other ways. More apps on our gadgets to save more time to do more things on those apples that don't grow on trees. We today have less time to do what we want to do than in any other generation. Why is that? We have become victims of our own success, family of God. We have more money to spend than in any other generation ever had. There's more experiences that can be bought by that money, but we have the same amount of time that all the other generations had before us. Here is the problem for the Christian. All those modern experiences often seem much less attractive are much more attractive and satisfying than prayer. Fewer Christians have really experienced the true power of prayer and intimacy with God and therefore find no satisfaction in desiring to be alone with God. Therefore, they see little beauty in it and they don't desire it. Wang Mang Dao, a Chinese Christian, put it this way. He said, when I was put in jail, I was devastated. I was 60 years old at the peak of my powers. I was a well-known evangelist and wished to hold crusades all over China. I was an author. I wanted to write more books. I was a preacher. I wanted to study my Bible and write more sermons. But instead of serving God in all these ways, I found myself sitting alone in a dark cell. I could not use the time to write more books. They deprived me of pen and paper. I could not study my Bible and produce more sermons. They had taken my Bible away. I had no no one even to witness to as the jailer for years just pushed my meals through the hatch. Everything that had given me meaning as a Christian worker had been taken away from me and I had nothing to do, nothing to do except to know God. For 20 years, that was the greatest relationship I have ever known, but the cell was a means to that relationship. Wang Mang Dao goes on to say, I was pushed into a cell, but you will have to push yourself into one. You have no time to know God. You need to build yourself a cell so that you can do for yourself what persecution did for me. Simplify your life. Simplify your life, family of God. Three simple applications from this parable to develop our prayer life. Go to God. Very simple. Go to God. Verse 3 says, And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. The widow had a need and took the need to where she knew she could get help. 
When you have a need, converse with God, communicate with God, talk to God as you talk with others. Don't try to go somewhere else for help. Go to God. Very simple. In every situation, just cry out to Him. And you will be surprised that in spite of the billions of people that are on this earth, God hears your prayer. Go to God. My second application is go again and again. Not just one time. Not just when you have not heard, not got an answer. Go again and again. Do you know in this passage, especially in that era and in the, in the ancient East, the widows needed help on a regular basis. Widows by their very nature were unable to be independent. The same is true of Christians. We need help. We cannot be independent. We have to go to back to God again and again for the same things. We need to ask for help from God on a regular basis. So she kept going to the judge until she get, got an answer. And verse 5 says, Yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. When we are praying for salvation for someone or a nation, we need to keep going to God. Family of God, one of the simple disciplines I have for my desire and obedience for the salvation of people. I pray, but with that, I keep a list of 10 people on a card, simple card. The 10 people I want to be, want, want to be saved for them to know about Jesus, for them to be part of the church. And can I encourage you, I have kept that discipline for the last three decades. And I'm not saying this that I am some great guy. But everyone I have put on that list in 10, 15, 20, 25, 29 years, I have seen them come to know Jesus. I've been very encouraged. But I have not given up. As soon as one is saved, another one joins the queue. And you keep praying for them very simply. Very simply. We believe what the Lord is saying. We are praying for the salvation of the world and actually doing it. You know, in 1995, we first time heard about Uttar Pradesh and its millions who do not know Jesus. Uttar Pradesh is just next door to Delhi. But we prayed for 20 years before the Lord took us there. 20 years. Why? Why such a long time? I have no answer. Why? But we persisted in praying, and the Lord eventually took us there and made us part of a soul-winning effort. And that gives great meaning and great satisfaction. Going again and again and persistently back to God for the same people, for the same problem, for the same issues. You think God is bored? No. My final application to you, family of God, is change the world by your prayers. Change the world by your prayers. There are three kinds of people. As they say, those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those who say, what happened? People who pray are the ones who make things happen. Intercessors are the historians of the world. Intercessors are those who are writing the new history of God's redemption and salvation of this world. Verse 7 says, And will not God bring about justice for His chosen ones who cry out to Him day and night? Will He keep putting them off? The widow got what she asked for. Persistent prayers get results. Prayer is not family of God. The phone call to the airline or to the service computer agency, you know, which is put on hold and you hear that ugly music 
interrupted frequently by the message call. This, your call is important to us. Kindly keep on hold. That is not what prayer is, family of God. The Word of God says, will He keep putting them off? The answer is no. The answer is no. Notice the extreme contrast between this judge and our God. One is unjust, the other is just. One is godless, the other is God himself, therefore godly. Cares about no one, cares about us so much that he sent his son into the world. Put him on the cross for us. If we doubt that he does not care and he does not answer. This judge hated people. God loves us. The widow could not go to an unjust judge and just by persistence get an answer. Jesus says that even if this widow could get an answer, why will we not get answer from a loving heavenly father? Look at God. There is no obstacles to come to God in prayer. God even wants you to come to him in prayer. Prayer is the life breath of a Christian. God will not put us off. Bible teaches us that when we come to him in faith, he will reward us. But yet, I think the hardest thing in the world to do is to pray. Yet, perhaps, it is the most necessary thing. Persistent prayer is how we express our faith in God. Is it not what we see or feel, friends? It is not what we feel or see, but what he says in his word. That is important. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the encouragement of your word. Thank you, Lord, that it is not how we feel or what the world says. It is not what we see or what other people say, but what your word says, which is important. Thank you for the encouragement that we have received from your word today. Give us the will, discipline, and the obedience to persist in prayer. We bless you and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity for me to bring God's word. The brochure of DBI would be available somewhere in the hallway. Please pick it up if you do not have one already. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Well, we're going to sing number 603, a hymn that uh, John Newton wrote to teach his congregation about prayer. Come, my soul, your plea prepared. Jesus loves to answer prayer. He himself has bid you pray, therefore will not turn away. You are coming to a king. Large petitions with you bring, for his grace and power are such none can ever ask too much. Number 603. Oh, my soul. 
I tell you, he will answer speedily those elect who cry to him. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you ask us to pray, and therefore you will answer our prayers. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the presence and fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.